Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Baron Jacques de Normandy from the Barony of Dragon's Lair in the Kingdom of Ontir. Um, this is a class I've given, or a discussion I've given several times for work, actually, and I've got a nice, big, long PowerPoint presentation to show everybody. Um, this was originally written for, I, I work in IT, this was originally written for um, developers, project managers, uh, business owners, business analysts, within King County in Seattle, in the Seattle area in Washington. And that's what I do professionally. So I'm going to kill my video um, and just go straight to the PowerPoint here. Let's see if this works. Hopefully share screen works here. Okay, are you, is everybody able to see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, we can. Perfect, okay. So this is digital accessibility in the SCA. Um, it It is kind of a, a technical presentation. Like I say, it was designed for uh, UX designers, web programmers, um, business analysts, uh, department heads within King County, but it's something that I've kind of... Uh, evangelized. I've even talked to Charles de Bourbon about this, and he kind of wants me to maybe even present it to the board of directors. So <clears throat> we'll see where it goes. So a little bit about me. Um, yes, I am qualified to do this. <laughs> I've got over 25 years in software quality testing experience. Uh, I've worked for the DOD. I've worked for Microsoft. I've worked for small companies, large companies. Um, I started at King County almost 10 years ago when I got tired of making uh, Bill Gates richer and designing better missiles for the Navy. I This is a, a great place for me to work. I get to work with the community. My first project there was low-income fares for people riding the Metro bus system, and I, I felt great about that. Um, I'm a certified professional accessibility core competencies. Uh, a, a certification I had to study for, uh, take a test, receive it. I am also a web accessibility specialist. That's another certification that I've earned uh, over the last few years. I am a member of the King County uh, ESJ committee. They use ESJ for equity and social justice, um, whereas you know we have DEIB. That almost every group has their own little acronyms, but it's I'm working on that group for King County as well specialize in making our websites and applications ADA compliant. And finally, not only a tester, but I'm a user. Um, after about 50 years of diabetes, I've got bad eyes. Um, so working on computers and finding applications and websites that are not accessible, it's really annoying to me. Um, moving on. So I like to present these our actual statistics that I pulled from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control inside the United States, I imagine they're probably apical uh, across the entire world. But one in four people has some sort of disability, believe it or not. Um, a lot of us think disability and we see the outwardly uh, visual things, you know, somebody in a, in a wheelchair, in crutches, uh, you know, the blind, uh, the deaf people signing. There are a number of categories of disability that are also invisible. Mine is invisible. I have low vision. Um, you can't tell them this until you see me trying to use my phone and holding it three inches from my face or uh, working on a computer and, and sitting with my face in the monitor. Um, so kind of a breakdown on that. Uh, of course, mobility initially, that's, you know, walking, stairs, uh, using peripherals. Believe it or not, a mouse is considered a, a mobility-enabled device, and um, applications need to be able to work without a mouse. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but uh, a mouse is actually a, a privilege you know, in the accessibility world. Um, cognition. This is an, an, a big one that's actually increased in its numbers over the last three years as more and more people are discovering that they're on the spectrum. Um, this is, you know, problems with, you know, cognition, remembering things, making decisions, and the way you design your websites 
and your applications can actually affect how people are reading your web pages, how they're filling out forms, and how they're doing things. I, uh, we had a, a public town hall for uh, King County with the Department of Health and Human Services, and we had constituents, members of the county, come into the Zoom meeting and talk about the issues they were having with online forms. Um, and it was everything from, you know, the font is too small. I can't change the font on this. This PDF isn't loading or it loads on my phone and it's impossible to see. Or uh, the forms are in a different order depending on which one you're looking at. And, and we took all this in and we make these changes because it's it's an issue. You can't fill out a form. You can't get services within the county. And, and that that's bad. Um, independent living. And that's just you know, just difficult being alone. That is considered a, a, a disability according to the CDC and, and the ADA. Um, so the more assistance we can provide in a website, the easier it is for people to use. Um, hearing, not just the deaf, but those with difficulty hearing. And that's why uh, most of the, you can turn on closed captioning in Zoom um, it does a pretty good job, but, you know, the videos that we we post should be closed captioned as well so that people can read this. Um, vision. This is where I fall in, blindness or serious difficulty seeing conditions. I have had diabetic retinopathy. I've had cataract surgeries. I've, my, my eyes are messed up. I Luckily, it's just my close vision, so I can still fence, and I can still drive, and I can still ride a motorcycle. Just don't ask me to read a book while I'm doing it, um, unless it's large print. Um, and then the last one is, is self-care, and that kind of ties in with the independent living, um, but it's just trouble taking care of yourself. All of these count as disabilities, and are it, uh, conditions that require accessibility according to the United States ADA laws, which is what I'm going to talk about next here. So it started in 1964, and that was the, the, the first one, the Discrimination Act, and that was, you know, you can't discriminate based on race, religion, sex, national origin, all those. Um, it, it led to things like, you know, hiring practices, uh, that this is where uh, desegregation came in, um, you know, the uh, the busing, the integrated schools, all that. It goes all the way back to there, and that's where it started, and it was a great first step. Since then, there have been a lot more. There was the Rehabilitation Act of 73, which now added a disability to the, to the categories that are protected. Um, so anything funded or conducted by the federal government, this is schools, institution, transportation, jobs, you can't discriminate based on uh, disability now. And then 1990 is when the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act came in. And it, the interesting thing is that it's a civil rights law. Um, so it's not just, it's not a federal law, it's, it's a civil rights law. So uh, it kind of opens up the uh, lobby for court cases. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this presentation is based around the law. Um, I, I kind of initially did it as kind of a scare tactic <laughs> for, for my work because we were, weren't were meeting a lot of these things on digital accessibility. And I, I had to enforce that that is the law because in 1998, Section 508 was added to the ADA, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. And that specifically deals with information technology. Um, if those of you who are old enough to remember the internet, you know, AOL and everything started coming in 95, 96, by 98, you know, the websites everywhere. And then 2000 was the era of the dot gons. Um, luckily, I avoided that. But it, it really became huge and became fast. And the government said, oh, wow, um, there's a lot of commerce being done here. There's a lot of banking. Uh, you know, think of how many things you do online. I, you know, I pay all my bills. I uh, do shopping, Amazon. Uh, you know, you go to Microsoft, you're downloading apps, you're watching TV, even, you know, even streaming services. Now, all of this falls under the Section 508 having to do with digital accessibility and digital information. So why have accessible websites? You know, equity. Everybody deserves the same 
chance to be able to read and get the information that's out there. It's not for it's not just for people with perfect vision and perfect hearing who uh, are able to move a mouse around and you know move with both hands and and multitask and follow half a dozen directions at the same time. It, it's not just for them it's it's for everybody and everybody needs to have that access especially with the proliferation of the amount of information that is out there today i mean how many times do you call a place and they say visit our website at or you know if you need to make a payment visit our website at um, it, it needs to be able it needs to be accessible to everyone and second it is the law <laughs> Uh, from the Section 508, 1998. Um, I also follow some law groups who specialize in ADA court cases. And if you look, you can see that in 2015, when uh, they actually started tracking this back in 2010, and there was less than 1,000 cases. But in the last 13, 14 years, it has almost doubled, but it's going up by about 25% a year. And it's actually created an entirely new category of uh, litigation. And you, you've heard of the old ambulance chases. You know, if you've been hurt in an accident, call us at 1-800 and, you know, we'll get you money. There are a number of law firms out there that specialize in this. You know, have you been discriminated against on this, on a website? Can you not complete your things? Call us. We will get you cash. And unfortunately, uh, Court cases can settle for up to $150,000, and if you are a government institution or if you're receiving any sort of federal funding, you can lose that. Um, so ADA law, lawsuits are a serious thing, and they're coming. Luckily, they're, it's not instant. You have, a, you have a remediation period. You know, If you're found guilty in court, you usually have anywhere from 60 to 90 days to fix the issue on the website. If you don't, then you get hit with a fine and, and things like that. So what are the requirements? Um, there's something called the, I call it the WCAG. Other people call it the WCAG. I, I don't like using that word. I just call it the WCAG. And it is the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They're an international standard developed in 2008 by the Worldwide Consortium or the Illuminati or somebody, the, the big group of people who run the web. And it's part of the Web Accessibility Initiative. And this is pretty much worldwide. Um, I know it is now the standard for the United States. Uh, I looked it up the other day. It is also the standard for Canada. I know we've got people in here from Lockick. I think Australia probably uses it as well. There are a couple few exceptions, I think, Japan uses it plus a few other things. And I think France, I think France might be doing their own thing, but it's basically based off of this. These are pretty much the worldwide standards for web accessibility. And I'll, I'll show you the list um, later on in the presentation here. It's uh, pretty comprehensive. Um, there's a new version that just came out last October, uh, version 2.2. Just a few little tweaks, mostly about around uh, mobile devices with the advancements that have come in, you know, the new iPhones and the new Samsungs and advancements in Android and progressive web uh, applications and, and all that. So some, some new stuff has come out around that. Um, and the nice thing is it's accepted by ADA and Section 508. For a while, Section 508, believe it or not, was actually owned by the Department of Homeland Security. I don't know why, but Section 508 was owned by Homeland Security, and they tried developing their own standards. And I think somebody said, uh, hey, they already exist. It's called the WCAG. And they're like, oh, great. And now everything on Section 508 just redirects to the WCAG, which is helpful. Um, now, there are some conformance levels of the, of the WCAG. There is level A, which is the most basic requirements. It's about... Uh, 30 or 40 things that you have to meet to hit level double A. And this is for uh, commercials, nonprofit, basically anything that's not government. Government is double A. Um, this is the requirement I test against 
being in King County. Uh, we're held to a little higher standard. Um, there's some things around uh, contrast ratio, font sizes, um, seizure rates for flashing, timing of elements, things, uh, things like that. They're a little bit more stricter. Um, then there's level triple A. Um, the only site I know of that is level triple A compliant is the WCAG site. Um, it's it's not recommended. It is a really really hard metric to me, but they made it. They they did it. Uh, it leaves you with not the most exciting website, but it is fully accessible to uh, blind, deaf, mobility impaired. You can navigate everything with a keyboard. Um, it will work perfectly with a screen reader. It will translate into Braille if you have that equipment. It, it it's it's tough to meet. Sometimes level two is even difficult for us to meet at the county level. So getting into the WCG, there are four main principles of the WCG. First is perceivable. This is what you see. This is what you're going to see on the screen. Um, everything needs to be accessible to everyone in ways they can perceive. This means, um, you know, for the completely blind, uh, use a screen reader that will go through and it will uh, it'll read elements for you, say button, and a label. Uh, this is why people ask for alt labels on J on JPEG images because you can't see them. So you put these alt labels that tell you what the picture is of. Um, you can also, you know, include things in there like you know, uh, non informational, and then a description of the picture. Uh, so so screen readers. What else? Um, uh, uh, the screener is outputting to Braille. This is a closed captioning for low vision, uh, being able to adjust your screen size and your font size. You know, people are probably familiar with the hold down the control button, use the scroll wheel. That'll uh, shrink and blow up things. Um, you know, uh, the rules say it has to be perceivable up to 200% zoom and not cause horizontal scrolling on your screen. Um, it, it gets pretty detailed, but it's it has to be readable and usable across a number of devices. Operable, this is the mobility issue. Um, the hardest part is making a website or an application usable without a mouse. There are some applications you just simply can't use without a mouse and they have to ask for variances and it has to be described in their software that uh, a, a mobility device such as a mouse or a tablet or something must is required in order to use the software. You know, a lot of a lot of video games are that way. Um, I used to work for Visio for Microsoft, and you had to use a mouse to do that. It, there was just no way to work without a keyboard. So you can get exceptions, but you have to be very upfront about your software not being able to do that. Um, the next one is understandable. This is sometimes a difficult one. This is where the cognitive issues come in. And a lot of people on the spectrum, uh, you know, like, so we had an open house about this and I received a lot of input on this and it, it's difficult. I'm pretty much neurotypical. So I have to stop and I have to think, and I have to read things over and over again when I'm testing to see if it makes sense to everybody. Um, I've made my developers go and change the language of error warnings and things because at the the at the root of it it wasn't completely clear or things could be taken a different way so i've had to say you need to reword this so like why i'm like because your phrasing here uh is reading like a question rather than a statement so things like that need to be fixed um so it must be understandable um and this has to do with like error messages. Uh, vague error messages are, are horrible when, uh, you know, something comes up and says, uh, missing a field. Well, what field am I missing? You, you need to include that information for people. And finally, robust. Um, <clears throat> this means it needs to, this, this is the one where it says it needs to work on a variety of browsers. It needs to work on Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer. It needs to work on, uh, Windows, it needs to work on Apple, Safari, it needs to work on Android devices, it needs to work on Linux devices, it needs to work on uh, iPhone devices. It needs to be uh, good enough and written 
in such a way that it isn't specifically dependent on parameters within a system. This is this is the very technical um, section of it. And honestly, I know a lot of our SCA websites are built on WordPress and things like that, which is a great uh, platform. And it, we really don't have to worry about the robust unless people start writing their own code, their own code for pages, which can sometimes cause problems, which I will actually demonstrate here by throwing my own kingdom under the bus a little bit. Um, so examples of perceivable content, alt text, I mentioned those. That's so that when you tag to an element, it doesn't, uh, somebody who is blind and using uh, a, a keyboard navigation comes to an element and it doesn't just say image. Like, what is the image? It'll tell them because a screen reader will actually read that alt tag. Closed caption for videos. Um, there, are level, there are levels of this. Um, for the completely blind who can't read closed captioning, oftentimes a, uh, a text file needs to be attached to a video so that text file can be opened by a screen reader and either read to them. Um, uh, for the for the deaf blind, it then the screen reader actual output to a braille device so they can basically get the content of a video through braille. It, it's written like a, a screenplay, um, but that's level two and up stuff. It, uh, in general, we aren't going to be uh, worried about that. Text transcripts, yep, yeah, um, I just mentioned that. Content independent of shape, color, size, location, sound. Um, a real world example I had of this, and it didn't have to do with the web, I was uh, helping lists at a crown event and I was putting up the shield board and we had all the fields, you know, blue, black, green, yellow, red, everything. And a knight came up to me and he said, what field am I on? Uh, am I, on? I said, oh, which is your shield? He pointed it out. I said, oh, you're on, uh, you're on the black field. And he says, which one is black? I'm like, excuse me? He says, I'm colorblind. Black and blue look the same to me. And I was like, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. And I pointed him out to his field and he's like, thank you. And he went off. And I, I thought about that and things being uh, displayed simply by color isn't going to work. They, they need text labels along with them. Um, so sometimes infographics without labels or legends aren't going to work for people. Um, you can't use sound to indicate changes of uh, state in a website because the deaf won't get it. And so the thing I tell my developers is you need to have two points of information. You know, a text and a color is fine. Um, you know, generally, a legend and a label is the best way to go. Um, if you have an error, make sure there's warning around it. Don't make it red because colorblind people won't see red um, or, or some can't see red or it's going to show up the same way. Make sure that there's, you know, text around it and, and bold it or highlight it or do something else. Um, orientation, that has to do with uh, landscape. You cannot, landscape and portrait, you can't force your uh website to only work on portrait. You know, I developed our, our website for mobile phone. Great. It's going to look terrible in a browser that's using 16 by 9. Um, again, color as a means of conveying information, you can't use uh, red and green. You know, red is red is good. Green is bad. Uh, I have a friend who's colorblind and uh, uh, we work at the theater and his wife will send us out for paint. And we're like, what color do you need? She says pink. And I said, what shade? And she says, oh, just something pink. I'm like, no, you have to give us a color card because Scott's colorblind and I don't care. So, you know, we have, we have to be very specific about things like that. Uh, minimum contrast ratios. Um, I'll show you what I mean by this, but uh, uh, white text on a gray background can't be seen. Um, on here, I love our colors, white and gold, but they don't work on a, well, yeah, gold does not work on a white background. Um, that's why I, I do my presentations in white on black. It's the highest possible contrast ratio. It's 21 to one. Um, I use large fonts. This presentation completely meets ADA standards for a government presentation. Uh, you need to be able to resize your text and you have to watch for uh, text spacing occurring. Um, one thing I should also add on this being in a, a medieval society, while medieval fonts are neat and look great, they are terrible things to put on a website for people trying to read it. The uh, 
the, for the people with low vision, um, people with dyslexia, it's it's impossible to read. You need to use they they recommend fonts like Arial, Calibri, you know, Times New Roman, just basic straight fonts. There is a special font out there um, that is designed for uh, uh, for dyslexic readers. Um, I've shown friends how to, uh, you can override the fonts on your computer so that your Firefox will automatically default to that font to you. It's, it's pretty neat things. So. Um, operable. So all function available through the keyboard. I've learned to navigate websites and the internet and windows and everything without a mouse. I can do everything on my computer just by using the keyboard. Uh, it's a combination of arrow keys, up and down keys, left, right, uh, certain hot keys. You, you learn what they are. You can look them up. Um, you know, like if you want to open up Windows Explorer, it's Windows key E. To get to the desktop, Windows key D. Uh, if you want to log out, Windows key L. It uh, keeps you from having to use the mouse and go down to the start button. If you hit the Windows key and type things in, you can launch programs. Um, very helpful and, and required for accessibility. No keyboard traps. Um, this is kind of an advanced thing when you're working with uh, numerous forms that have forms within forms. You can get in inside a form within a form. And if you can't get out, you know, if it requires you to use the mouse to click back to the previous form, uh, that doesn't work. Um, you're you're kind of stuck there and you can't go anywhere. Then you reload the page and you lose your information. You got to start over. Not good. Um, keyboard shortcuts, like I mentioned, Windows keys, things like that. Um, you can build those into applications, and uh, there are some that work within uh, your browsers. Um, uh, timing of elements. This is a thing like uh, Ticketmaster. You have 10 minutes to purchase your tickets. Um, I believe they have a button that says, I need more time. You you can click on that or select it and do that. Uh banking information will do that. You know, you haven't done anything for five minutes. We're going to log you out. You need to be able to press a button that says, I need more time. And that has to do with uh, um, being able to navigate through a keyboard. Um, you can't just slide across the screen and click on something. Flash rate and seizures. Three three flashes a second, I believe, is the, uh, the cutoff. Um, so if you have... You know, back in the early days of the internet, you know, people had, I don't know who remembers hamster dance, but it was, you know, flashing and dancing hamsters and music and um, also uh, responsible for a number of people having seizure attacks from it. Um, things have since changed than that. You don't see it as much anymore, but it's something that needs to be uh, watched for. Uh, bypass, bypass blocks. Um, usually these aren't visible unless you're using a, cre a screen reader, but what it lets you do is skip a lot of content and jump to the main content. You can jump past the headers and things. It's it's primarily for screen readers. Uh, focus order. This means as you're moving through a website with the keyboard, things are in order, top to bottom, left to right. So you aren't going from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, back up to the middle. Things are, are going to make sense and flow correctly. Uh, and labels for things, images, uh, telling people you're on an input field, telling people it's a drop down. This is a label. This is you're uh, now looking at a form or or an ordered list. All of that is important. Um, understandable content. Oh wow, I'm ready. Ready for thirty five minutes. Okay, I'll go. I'll speed up here a little bit so we can have time for questions at the end. Um, language of the page, you need to tell what language your page is in. Usually it's English, but that's for screen readers, so they know what language to read to you in. Uh, context on focus, it needs to tell you if this is a clickable button, if this is a clickable link, if this is a fillable form. Uh, consistent navigation, if you have multiple pages, multiple forms, they're all filled out the same way. Uh, labels and instructions, uh, there needs to be information that tells you what are required fields, what are not required fields. Uh, very important. It, 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 it's horrible to fill out a form and say you missed a required field, but it doesn't tell you what field it is. Uh, error suggestions. So when you do make an error and something isn't right, it needs to tell you not only what you did wrong, but what you need to do to fix it. 
and error prevention, in other words, uh, this is especially for legal and financial things, being unable to submit a form with missing uh, legal information. And then, you know, having the, you know, you think you submitted your taxes and all of a sudden like, oh, you forgot to put your name on your taxes. That would be bad. Robust. Uh, this is some really technical stuff. Parsing using text. Uh, it, it, it's high and technical stuff that I, I present, but uh, it's programming stuff. You know, make sure you have the right, correct tags for fields and buttons. Things are nested correctly. Uh, name roll values uh, so that they can be found and read by a screen reader. Statuses messages uh, need to be presented to the assistive technology, so you can't have any hidden messages or anything. I'm almost done here. So some free ADA tools. Um, first off, I, I'm actually going to show you some of these as I go here real quick. Uh, I'm going to turn my mouse back on. There we go. Oh, it doesn't want to let me do it. Oh, well. Um, I will show you these. The, the, the checklist, the WCAG, WAVE is a free tool that is an accessibility checker. You just, it's an, uh, a plugin for Chrome that I use, and it'll show you every, it, it doesn't look at everything, but it will look at the code behind your page programmatically and tell you if there are any issues with it. Um, this is one I really like, NVDA. It is a free screen reader. I'm sure some of you may have heard of of JAWS, which I actually have at work, but NVDA um, has some really neat features to it. And I'm, I'm going to demo it here in a second. And then uh, Google Chrome actually has an accessibility checker built into it. You press F12 to get to it and you uh, run something called Lighthouse and it will run, uh, uh, it'll run a check on you and basically do It'll give you a percentage score and tell you where you're missing out on things. Yeah, let's go and do that. Um, I'm I'm going to demo something real quick. And this, can you guys still see the Ontario website here? Can I just keep the recording so we can have this in in the sure. uh, channel? Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to demo a couple things. Um, come on, control, Alt. There it is. So I just start up. I just started up Nvidia. I have the. It's it's a screen reader. Yes, yes, hello, there we go. So if you see something here, you can see as I'm tabbing, it is highlighting things. That's part of a the function of a screen reader. Um, it's nice for low vision people too, who are using the keyboard, I can tell you where you are. So here's, here's the biggest problem with our website. Say you go to our people here. If you hover over it, it gives you this nice JavaScript drop down, lets you go around and do everything. You cannot access that drop down through the keyboard. So if you hit it, it goes to an empty page. So I hate to say it, but our Kingdom website is not accessible to people with um, Uh, with mobility issues. Um, if I go here and, you know, I can do things with the mouse, but I can't do it with any, with the, uh, with the keyboard. So, you know, at some point I've been asked to go through and, you know, and do full, oops, do full, um, I'm going to turn this off because it's still talking to me. Yeah, let's go ahead and do questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Okay, and I'm going to end recording now.